We're up kicking about football. The oldest looked over and he says, What's that missing hut over there? Over at the far end of the pitch. I says, That's Tommy Donnelly's boxing club. The ring. I says, That's probably the best known club in the town. And Dean says, I want to try a bit of that. I want to do that. And Ben says, Well, if you're doing it, I'm doing it. And the two of them looked at Tyrone. Tyrone says, Well, I'm doing it too. I'm doing it too. Tommy Donnelly took Ben and Dean on, told Tyrone to go home. He was too wee. Tyrone's face fell just, he wouldn't, he just wasn't having it. He tugged at my side and said he wanted to talk to me. I went outside with him and he said, I wanted, to, I wanted to go in there. I wanted to do that, he says. I says, you will be doing that. And then Tommy Donnelly came outside too and he says, Tyrone, we'll take you up surely. He says, you can just watch the training for a few weeks and then you can do a bit yourself. So that was them on their way. And uh, Dean, God help him, he didn't make it. Ben, he boxed, he boxed well, very well. But Throne, he stayed at it. I could see that he had something special. It's the way his brain was wired up too. It was wired up differently for boxing. I think I'm a bit of a quieter person, you know, I wouldn't be very outgoing, but when I get in the ring, you know, it's when I'm most confident and it's when I feel, feel, feel alive and just feel myself. The tough part's the eight, ten weeks before when you're killing yourself, making weight and murdering yourself and training, that's a hard part, and then fighting's a but you enjoy, it's the easy part. What's next for you then? Obviously the Celtic title is a step of stone to other things. That was a British title eliminator. Is that what title you're after next or? Fuck a British title, I'm Irish. Well, that, that fits me in my place anyway. <laughs> My two brothers done it and then I just wanted to follow in their footsteps and do whatever they were doing when I was young and then they fell off the wayside and I kept at it. I've seen a lot of people like, especially when they get the 16, 17, 18 boxers with loads of talent just falling off, stopping doing it just like that. And I probably would have been one of those, but my dad was very, very keen on me boxing and uh, you know, when I was out chasing girls or going out drinking, you know, he always would have came down hard on me and Thank God I stuck at it and here I am now, still doing it. So I was 14 years old. I had won maybe three Irish titles at the time. I thought I was I was the king, king of boxing, of cracked boxing, oh my God. No one's ever going to beat me. And then after these championships, Lusters, and there was two names I think on it. One was T. McCullough. I don't know, I've never heard of this guy in my life. And I was walking out, I had all the fleshiest gear on. I read, I just spent a lot of my own custom gear and I was walking out thinking it was king and I seen this guy on the other side of the ring he's wearing a pair of trainers not even boxing boots <laughs> he's wearing red shorts a green vest a big ugly head guard and I just looked at him and I went this guy's going to get hurt <laughs> I felt sorry for him I was like why is the coaches even that the coaches know who I am why aren't they even putting this kid through this I felt a bit sorry for him jumped in and he just started throwing punches and, and landing and everything I was like what the fuck's going on and uh, he beat me. He somehow beat me 7-4. I claim it was a robbery. It was a hiding. It was a, it was a, <laughs> a serious robbery. I think he got the two Tyrones mixed up, to be honest. <laughs> and uh, he beat me there. And then I hated him ever since. Hated him. And we met again the same, the next year. Same championships. 
And that time I did get a head, he <laughs> battered me up and down the ring. It was 20, 22 to 11 or something. I used to get a lot of grief in the Irish team. It was called the novice because <laughs> of my style, because it is very unorthodox. And my teammates always used to say to me, where did you learn to box? Or who, who taught you to box like that? Because uh, it's not the way you're supposed to box. At the same time, a lot of people say, Tyrone, I hate, I hate sparring you. You're so, so awkward. I can't, can't get a punch off on you. A few people have tried to change me, but it's like you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And um, so far, so good, so we'll stick with it. I was looking at photos yesterday of his granda. Uh, one night up in Oma, he had a belt with him for the All Ireland. And I, could, I knew by the old fella that he was just, could, he thought he was in heaven, <laughs> getting photographed with Tyrone in the All Ireland belt and smiling from one end of his face to the other, you know. <laughs> the best behaved person growing up, you know, I brought a lot of trouble to the door. But uh, in the last last couple of years, like, they think I've matured a wee bit and even now I'm, uh, I'm trying to help them as much as possible. When I was about 13 or 14, my ma took on well. She got, got a disease called ataxia. She's in a wheelchair full time now and my dad's a full-time carer, he doesn't really have a man at them himself. It must be tough, like, because she's got no short-term memory, so she's constantly, she's constantly calling him every, I would say every five minutes, she would hear, hear him sh shout out to him, what day is it, what time is it, just all these constant, same questions, day after day after day after day, and then I worry about him because that's going to take a toll on his mental health as well, especially with the history he has with it. It's a competition called the Golden Contract. The idea behind the name is there's a golden contract at the end of it for a top, top promoter. So it's eight world rank fighters. I won my quarter final, now fighting in the semis. So there's me and three others there, three very, very good lads. They're all ranked in the top 10 in the world. It's life changing if you want it. You get a five fight deal with uh, every fight's worth six figures. So. I can't start thinking about the, the money yet, but if I won this next fight and win the final, it'll be, it'll be in my head anyway. I find it very easy to identify with the notion of a fight, that life's a fight. Life can be a fight. And I think if I had been a boxer, never was a boxer, but if I think I had been a boxer, I wouldn't have liked to give up either. <laughs> like, like he doesn't, Tyrone doesn't. It's a father-son thing too, like when you pick your child up and he's hurt or he's, he's hurt emotionally or he's hurt physically or he's cut his knee, and you, you forge bonds that just can't be broken. He gives me his talk so it is, <laughs> but I suppose I need to hear them. And then nights, nights where I do be going out one or two nights too often then it would be a bit of a frosty atmosphere in the house. <laughs> Because he's that, he's that involved in my box. Not involved, but he, he just wants to see me do well, obviously. And he talks about the window of opportunity in, in boxing, how it's, that's the one that sticks out the most, is how the window of opportunity in boxing is very small, and I've got a very small time frame, and I should be making the most of it. Not out the town. <laughs> obviously, sometimes it falls in deaf ears. The window of opportunity, this sticks with me because I broke my neck in a demolition job. In Oma in August in 75, 1975. And uh, subsequent to that, they developed manic depression. I was in and out of the mental hospital. Fierce, rough time. Fierce, rough time. My memory always went back to the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast. The surgeon had told me, he says, You missed paralysis of your forelimbs, quadriplegia, by the smallest distance between your thumb and your forefinger. For so many hours, over and over and over again, I went over that in my head. I would have had to be lifted, fed, put in a chair, toileted. And I just thought, you know, I couldn't, just couldn't get my head around that. 
And Tyrone did say to me one time, Tyrone said to me, he says, well, he says, well, all that thinking in the hospital about what, what way it could have been, he says, do you think uh, that might have caused your manic depression? I says, well, you know, you don't know. You don't know. When I get back to the window of opportunity, I was trying to say to Tyrone that you have so many chances in life to do things, but when the opportunity comes, take it. There's all these pranks getting pulled. Like, every so often there was a wee prank and I was going, who the fuck is this? And then one day I walked in the room, Peter Brady rode across my bed and coffee. And I went, fuck me, Peter Brady, I was raising. I went hunting for Peter Brady and he's in the corner laughing his head off. He's there. Not, no one talking to him because no one liked him because of me. They all knew, they all knew me and, and didn't like him. And uh, he's there pulling pranks by himself. So I respected him and I said, you know what, he's actually a pretty funny guy. And I started hanging about him and then we became known as the two Tyrones and the biggest messers on the Irish team. Well, all he's done as a kid, like playing jokes on each other and then now the camera's on us and stuff like that. We've, we've just, just decided to start doing a lot of bets, which... I don't know if you've noticed, but He's I'm not very good at, at winning <laughs> the bets. So I had to dye my hair pink last week, it's now blonde. Well, the day has came and me and McCullough are off to get our pink hair and eyebrows done. Like Nearly it? there. <laughs> Beautiful, <laughs> Taylor. Do you love your eyebrows? Love them. I had to shave my eyebrows the week before. I've got a tattoo of them. Eating a burrito. Just a lot of... It seems like it's just me doing a lot of things. And I, he just sits Not there. Not one of any bets. I won one and you, you, you welched. <laughs> I remember I had been in Gorchin, the area that I used to walk in. And, and I decided to come up that night to um, a social club. I ordered three or four brandy in the one glass. And a song came on, Tears of a Clown. So I was out dancing on the floor, on my own. Dancing about the floor. And uh, they took me out of the club. And my mother asked me to go to the hospital. And I said, Mommy, why would I go to the hospital? I feel great. I never, ever felt better. They brought me up to the hospital. And uh, there, I was there about an hour in the waiting room. At a chair, I was watching television. A programme come on that I was interested in. And a uh, fellow with white coat come in. <laughs> and he says to me, um, it's Soon, soon be bedtime. And he went over to the back of the chair and he tipped the chair up, tried to tip me onto the ground. I got up and I just smelled him, knocked him out nearly. Two more of them came, knocked them two to the ground. And then I ran and I ran and I ran down corridors and here and there and everywhere. Got into a dormitory, knew I was trapped, jumped up on a bed and uh, had my hands on the head rail of the bed and they burst through the doors. The first two got kicked up the teeth, but then they got me. He shouted and roared, and it was like hell just all broke loose. Fought with them, they fought with me. Eventually they got me to the ground, and they called the female nurse then, and they had my trousers down, my underpants down. They jived me with peraldehyde. Hi, for you, Thank you. I like that. See what difference when you start fainting. Uh, like that little faint gets you into distance as well. You faint and you're getting out. You faint and attack. Uh, they, don't space, yeah. they, start, they don't know what's happening. They don't know what's happening. It's brilliant. I like that. You should cover it now, okay? Brilliant. Oh, here they are. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Representing Derry Ireland will professional record 14 and all. Please welcome Tyrone White Chocolate McCullough. Eight stone, 13 pounds, and five ounces. Tyrone McCullough.
Dean passed away when I was 30, four years ago. He was, he'd done a bit of box himself. He was one of, one of the people who I would have been talking about. It says he fell off the wayside and came about 17 or 18 and went, went after girls and, and the drink. He probably would have been my like number one supporter. You know, he loved, he loved boxing and like I said, my dad would have came down hard on me when I had a night out or went out drinking. He would have been the same, you know, uh, always would have chastised me. Considered packing it in because I hadn't officially turned, hadn't had my first fight yet, and I was thinking I just was not for it. But my dad sat me down and he says, "You know, he he was your biggest fan. You know, he would want you to do well in boxing more than more than anyone else. You should keep at it for him." And I might sound a bit cheesy, but I think about him just as the first bell goes and try and try and get every one for him or every victory for him. Dean. Dean was very special to me. He was the first born. Um, first time I'd seen a baby been born. He was a mental health nurse. Now, I don't know why he did that because I did it. <laughs> he said to me, he says, the only reason I done it is because you get a grant. And, uh, but I found out later in life was that he was very, very good with people and very, very good sitting and listening to people. He liked to drink. He liked to drink maybe a bit too much. And uh, so he was going to a wedding somewhere in Germany, I think. The girl he was going out with, he was coming back to buy, buy a house. She was pregnant. And uh, he obviously was hugely hungover coming back into Belfast. And uh, he was trying to get ready for work. So he took Cocodomo and then he took more Cocodomo and then he took more Cocodomo. I got a call from casually. He wasn't able to speak. Then he went to St Vincent's in Dublin and uh, he got a liver transplant but it was no good. He didn't make it just. But he was living with Tyrone at the time in Belfast. Dean and him were very, very close. This is one of the things about life. The death. Lo losing people. So, um, he was buried over in Craigan and that red glove goes up onto his grave now today sometime. I'm not going to say that he'll have any bearing on the result tonight, but It'll be on Tyrone's mind, don't we? With my mum and her, the way her disease was, like, I think, she, you know, sometimes she forgot because she has no short-term memory and then she remembered, like, this did happen a, a lot, say, the first year after I died, she would forget and then remember and she would just break down randomly and my dad would, my dad would start worrying then and Horrible. Like she could, she couldn't even bring herself to go to a funeral or anything like that, with the way she is. The very, very tough on him, you know, having to deal with both them things. And in fact, in that one year, my dad lost his son, his brother, and his own father. So, for him to come through that year, you know, with the history of the men, his, his own mental health and not have a relapse, you know, was very, very lucky, very good. The voice says, you know, sometimes when I be feeling down about something or annoyed or angry, I think, well, if he can come through what he's came through, then there's no reason why I can't pick myself back up again. Suicide. No, I attempted suicide in 1991. Donegal there. I was at the lowest point I've ever been. I thought I was going to lose my children, Throne, Dean and Ben. Um, Previous to that low, I'd been high, and, 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 and the low always comes after the high. And uh, I took a bottle of whiskey and tablets and went into the Donegal Hills. And, and then I woke up and I just seen, I don't know what it was, call it a vision or call it whatever you like, I don't really know. But I've seen the three boys standing in the doorway. Dean, Ben and Tyrone, and I heard them saying, "Go on home, Daddy. 
Come on, come on home. What his opponent doesn't know, what I do know about Truro, what I've known about him for a long, long time, is that if he's in the red corner and the guy in the blue corner has made out that he's better than Truro, that's, that doesn't work with Truro. You're not better than I am. I'm, I'd prove it to you. It's strange feeling the emotions you go through before a fight because you're in the change room, you're thinking you're the nerd. Anyone says they don't have nerves or lying, you've been nervous and you think, what am I doing here? <laughs> why, why am I doing this to myself? But then, you know, you're walking out towards the ring and everyone's cheering you on, there's a serious buzz going about, and then once the first bell goes, the nerves just go, and it's probably one of my favourite parts in the fight. It is a bit of a blur. Uh, the first five rounds, I thought I was coasting. I was coasting. Like I remember going out for the sec sixth, thinking this is too good to be true, and he landed a shot. And it's the first time I've ever been hit like that. Like at the time, I thought, am, am I even hurt here? And then I went to move, and my legs just went like that, and I, I fell. And maybe I shouldn't have went in the survival mode because I was still well in the fight. But I just started to think. Survive the fight, don't get stopped, don't get stopped. It was, it was not for letting him stop me, and uh, I could see he really, really wanted to, you know. I was just saying, you can't get stopped, you can't get stopped. So I'm, I'm proud that I can take a point like, but he was hitting me well a lot, so he was. I haven't been able to watch a fight back. I've watched, I have watched it back twice, but any time it's been away a few drinks on me, and I don't know why, I just haven't been able to watch it sober. My mates were texting me, I was just looking at my phone, I wasn't even. I don't even know if I was reading the message, I was just putting it down again and wasn't replying to anyone. I know they were texting each other saying, have you heard from Tyrone? He's not he's not speaking to me, he was just sitting in this room. I didn't even know what I was doing. Like the past the times probably getting a few car outs and I was just in a, a bad place. And one time I was just lying there sleeping, it was about six or seven o'clock in the day and my dad knocked on the door and found out I was sleeping and he knew that he didn't say nothing, he just closed the door in but he but he says the next morning I want to have a read. When he got beat there, he was four or five days in the room. Very down. I knew what was going on. And he knew that I knew. Because I'd been there myself. When you've been down and you've been up, and you've been in the middle and you've been ordinary, you've kind of done the lot and you understand a lot. We met up down the stairs one day and I says, look, Tron, we have to talk about this. And we started talking about it. And you have to understand that weakness is the cornerstone of humanity. It's not strength, it's weakness. That's what humanity is built on. And then I would keep reassuring him that I had a life to lead after this anyway. Even when boxing's finished, I says, you're gonna have to lead your life. You have fallen, you've had a fall. Now you get up, pick yourself up. High up on Black Peace Road, a ceaseless wind cries through the high bog. Irregular rhythms of sized air are pulsed from lonely hilltops as shadows rotate about the bladed turbines. 
Lost and alone stands the old national school. Silent now, the drone of educational hum, gone. Innocent, unlocked laughter echoes and fear of the master's ones. Soft sounds as a chuckling river ribbons in from the peaty bog, laughing along relentless to the town lights where people no longer listen or hear the sounds of the night. High up on Black Peace Road, my soul slips into the wakening dark. My breathing mind seeks out the night. Crooked sentry trees protect the way as air ghosts from the gone hump the empty lichen cottages along the way. Out here in unfettered darkness, the inky contours of the nowhere hills hide a naggy, pale moon burst slowly from behind still ominous clouds. Whole and near now, it crowns a vast firmament above, lost beyond infinity, unknowable. A silence of darkness enshrouds me as I stand here amidst the well-clothed sheep in this galaxied starry desert of unendingness, absorbing the sound of stone burbled water up here on Black Peace Road. <laughs>